Thank you for joining me today to talk about the Food Safety Collaboration and Internship at the University of Wisconsin-Madison Chemistry Department. My name is Tony Hoffine and I am the Global Smart Prep Market Development Manager for Horizon Technology. Horizon Technology sponsored the internship this summer and Elizabeth Krantz was chosen for the internship. Elizabeth is currently a senior at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. I served as lead scientist and project lead on the internship and Dr. Pamela Doolittle and Dr. Sherry Barta were both heavily involved and advised during the internship period this summer. I want to extend a thank you to both Dr. Doolittle and Dr. Barta as well as our fellow collaborators Shimatsu Scientific and Sepelko. It is amazing the amount of work that we accomplished this summer related to food safety and the results and experience that were gained are going to be presented. So let's go ahead and get started. The focus of the internship was really centered around food safety. This is something that is quite meaningful to all of us, being impactful globally and also uh, something that impacts not only our human health, but animal health and our global food chain. I'm sure that a lot of you have seen news stories about food safety issues. Here's an example from foxnews.com talking about aflatoxin, an invisible food hazard. Aflatoxin is one of the many mycotoxins that are natural sources of mold. This was our topic of interest for the internship. Being naturally occurring molds, you can imagine that there are many mycotoxins out there. In fact, 400 have been identified, but unfortunately not all of them are tested for. They do pose a significant crop and food problem with about 25% of the world's crops impacted by natural molds. The exposure to us and both animals relates to sickness and death depending on the level of exposure and duration of exposure. And pictured here is one example of natural mold occurring on a corn product. So the purpose of the food safety internship was to look at two specific mycotoxins. Vomitoxin that is a mold produced by heating and cooling of grains. It's, it has a formal name of deoxynivalenol. And interesting about this particular mycotoxin is that it is not removed by processing the grain. And that means that if you, for example, have a natural wheat agriculture crop that is contaminated, if you process that wheat into bread or cereal, those products will also contain the mold. We also wanted to look at aflatoxin because it is globally the most tested mold. It is produced in high temperature and high humidity conditions and because it is prevalent in many, many different agriculture and food products, it was one of, of great interest to test for. Now it wasn't just the testing of these two mycotoxins, but to take a look at what today's methods are using for steps to be able to quantitate and identify the mycotoxins and see where current chemistry, technology, and automation could be included to improve upon these methods. And improving upon them means also identifying the mycotoxins themselves and quantitating their presence in food and agriculture products. So we had a lot of fun this summer. We worked from the end of May through mid-August and had some amazing results. We'll share those with you. As a summary, this kind of brings it all down to one page here. We did show two posters at the International AOEC Conference. We also have seven publications available. One of them has already been published in the LCGC magazine in the September edition. We have one coming soon that will be published in Agro Food magazine and then have received word that there are future journals who are interested in publishing our articles. 
I just did receive word that we have been accepted to be an oral presentation at PitCon 2015 for some of our work as well. So you can see this internship was very successful and we did produce a lot of very good data that is generating some amazing discussions. So let's get started talking about the food safety collaboration and internship, both the methods and the results. In general, if you look at a food and agriculture safety method, they're typically quite lengthy. They take a lot of manual manipulation and time. And in general, not necessarily the easiest methods to perform. So what I've done here is outlined for you the typical manual steps that are in red, the steps that will get the sample from its natural form into a liquid form where you're hopefully pulling out the compounds of interest from the cellular structure, uh, from the, the actual natural product itself, so that once it's in a liquid form, you're able to now get that sample cleaned up and introduced onto a quantitative instrument such as a UHPLC system. With the science that was involved and the automation, we wanted to be able to provide to you some kind of flow path on how we performed everything. Let's take a step back and look at cartridge-based solid phase extraction. Well, solid phase extraction is a very versatile sample preparation technique, and its ultimate use is to remove interfering compounds in order to identify and quantitate the compounds of interest. There are many SPE techniques that can be automated, and the Smart Prep Extractor is a wonderful tool to perform that automation with 1 mil, 3 mil, 6 mil cartridges, as well as immuno affinity cartridges, which a lot of the standard AOAC methods use. When we're talking about techniques that can be automated, you could use cleanup, concentration to be able to concentrate a larger volume down to a smaller volume to see low-level analytes or compounds. Do a buffer exchange, for example, within like a protein type of extraction and be able to then have an acetonitrile or water-based extract to be able to inject onto your mass spec. And then of course simple filtration. Most of what we have done within this internship is isolated to using solid phase extraction as a cleanup technique. And that's important to keep in mind as we walk through some of the rest of the information. But in general, the Smart Prep SPE steps in, in a typical bind and elute would be to solvate the, the packing material within the cartridge with a methanol, followed by a water to neutralize it before you'd load your sample. And then you'd wash the particulates out that you don't want. So you'd maybe wash out some of the color, some of the protein, uh, some of the fats, 
And then your final elute steps would be to elute the compound or compounds of interest depending on how many classes of compounds you're looking for. So there is an importance that sample preparation brings to the table and I think the pictures that I have on screen here show it all. We tested for the aflatoxin application, almond milk, fresh corn, peanut paste, and curry powder. And during the liquid-liquid extraction step, you can see how the proteins have denaturized in the almond milk. The fresh corn is full of color and very cloudy and also rich with particulates. The peanut paste, extremely oily, and you can see it has a lot of very fine particulates that are left over from the peanuts actually breaking down. And the most difficult matrix that we worked with with the aflatoxin was the curry powder. And with curry powder, you can see the, the really rich color after liquid liquid extraction. And if you take a close look at the side of the flask, the Erlenmeyer flask has a lot of oil residue on it in a very deep, rich yellow color. Now, that curry powder was taken uh, through the SPE process, as were the other matrices on screen, but we took pictures of the curry powder to show how much positive impact solid phase extraction has on the sample preparation technique. So in the picture box, on the very right side, you can see the original Aflazia SPE cartridge. On the left are four examples of the curry powder being put through the SPE cartridge. If you can see the, the deep rich color that is maintained within the SPE cartridge so that that does not interfere as much as it would if you didn't use the SPE. So if we look to the very right of the screen you can see that the curry powder is being processed through the Smart Prep Extractor and this is where the SPE is performed. You can see the nice rich golden color that's being put through the smart prep and this is a result of the nice cleaning process that the cartridges performed. So sample preparation is definitely a necessity. In order to be able to clean the sample every step of the way, what you're doing is removing things you don't want, keeping the things that you do want, making your HPLC analysis so much easier that you're able to quantitate with confidence. When we're talking about the UHPLC system, we're talking about the system from Shimatsu. This is the Nexera XR HPLC system, and it is a binary system where we're introducing two different types of solvents that are mixed in line with an injector to be able to inject the sample onto the Titan column from Sapelco. And then we did use a fluorescence detector to be able to analyze for the aflatoxins. The aflatoxins shown, there are four aflatoxins, the G1, G2, B1, and B2, with the B1 aflatoxin being one of the most important aflatoxins to report. The vomitoxin was analyzed by the same HPLC system, but with UV detection. Another look at our general food and agriculture safety methods and you can see how important those red boxes are in getting the sample to a point where yes we can indeed take it and automate it and provide a nice clean extract for the HPLC system to analyze. So let's look at some of our scientific results. Now a lot of these methods are original AOAC methods that are improved upon. So what we have done here with the first application with the vomitoxin is to look at its presence in wheat samples. So we have spiked at both the US and the EU levels and the European Union levels have an acceptance criteria between 60 and 120 percent. So we not only looked at the natural product, which we are calling our control sample, but we also looked at spiked products as well, where we are introducing the mold on purpose to be able to determine the effectiveness of the chemistry technology and automation that we introduced and replaced in the method. 
So we looked at unprocessed to commercially processed samples. You can see the liquid liquid extraction images that relate to wheat berries, cracked wheat, wheat germ, shredded wheat cereal, and infant wheat cereal. The SPE and evaporation process was to load a portion of what we extracted from the liquid liquid extraction process and simply a load and collect. So this is the case where what is being retained on the column are the compounds that you do not want and what is being eluded out are the compounds like mycotoxin that you do want. So this would be considered to be a cleanup step where what is eluding directly from the cartridge is exactly the compounds that should be in that liquid. When we took a look at some of the results, we, we looked at all five types of samples that are wheat samples, and we did find that the control wheat germ, here's an example on the left side, did have natural deoxynivalenol present. So this one did has a, have a positive control result. We also spiked samples, and this is an example on the right side of the U.S. spike level of 1,000 microgram per milliliter. The results, we wanted to compare not only the U.S. to the EU spike levels, but also look at the automated to the manual SPE. So we looked at all five and what's shown on screen here, there are two matrices, both wheat germ and shredded wheat cereal that have natural vomitoxin present in the samples. These were samples that were purchased within the U.S. either off the grocery store shelf or through just a U.S. supplier on the website. So it does prove that indeed vomitoxin is a mycotoxin that once present in the grain is present throughout the processing to the final product. So the blue results are your U.S. spike levels, the yellow results are the EU spike levels, and the orange results are the manual SPE levels that compare with the yellow. You can see the results across the board meet our EU acceptance criteria from 60 to 120 percent. And we have very good comparability between manual and automated SPE at 200 microgram per kilogram. There is one sample that is a little bit high on the manual SPE and that is the wheat germ. And this is most likely due to concentration effect. Manual SPE is performed with a vacuum manifold. The automated smart prep extractor SPE is performed by positive pressure into open atmosphere. So there's no vacuum that is pulling like there is with a vacuum manifold. And when you do have a elution solvent like 84% acetonitrile under vacuum and you allow that to be pulled, you are concentrating and basically evaporating that sample. So you are producing more of a concentrated sample by the time that you are doing final analysis. So you may have started with two milliliters of sample, but you may have only ended up with maybe 1.8 in your final extract because of evaporation. So manual SPE is something that is a little bit more of a technique driven that, uh, process that needs to be monitored when you are having multiple technicians involved. And we don't see that impact with the Smart Prep Extractor. We have very good CVs on the blue U.S. spike levels and very good recoveries across the board. We also looked at the aflatoxin EU spike levels, 70 to 110 percent recovery, and now we do have a 20 percent RSD acceptance level. Aflatoxin, as we mentioned, is one of the most globally tested mycotoxins, and therefore there is a little bit more strict requirements on meeting both recovery and percent RSD when testing food products. Our goal with the aflatoxin was to develop a unique single method. In the case of aflatoxin, every single sample type is analyzed by a slightly different method. So there is a method for corn, there's a method for milk, there's a method for peanut paste, and so on. 
We developed an extraction solution formula based off of the water content of the original sample matrix. We took that from the USDA website and developed the formula that would apply to any type of sample matrix based off of its water content. We won't go through the details on this screen, but you can see the liquid-liquid extraction procedure that was followed. Next, the SPE procedure was followed, and again, it was another cleanup step, which allowed the compounds of interest to be eluded first. And if you remember back to the, the, the curry powder picture with the cartridges, I think that should make sense now because the column was trapping the items or the compounds of of non-interest and eluding out the aflatoxins. That's why the cartridges were so colorful. It was retaining everything we didn't want and eluding out only the aflatoxin. And in this case, the aflatoxin did require a pre-column derivatization procedure, which is noted here. And we did use a water bath for that, which was very interesting, not typically performed, but worked exceptionally well. In fact, so well that we do have a PICCON 2015 oral presentation on this, looking at our success rate of achieving linearity over the course of many weeks, a greater than 0.99 for four different aflatoxins, with each of the aflatoxins having a seven-point calibration curve. So very impressive data and uh, something that we found was very unique about this particular method another way to do derivatization. We also have some spike levels that looked um, at the chromatography and the chromatography was developed by looking at the separation of peaks and making sure that there was good separation between G1 and B1 and G2 and B2 so that we could get really nice baselining on all of the four peaks and allow for any interfering peaks to not interfere with the baselining of the four major aflatoxins. Results also showed that one of the sample matrices had a natural mycotoxin in it. So curry powder did report that it did have natural aflatoxin present. All the samples were purchased in a U.S. grocery store. However, the curry powder and peanut paste did have um, labels that indicated that they were from other countries. However, it did say on the label they were all distributed within the U.S. So the country of origin is unknown in these two particular cases. For automated SPE, which is the results that we're going to be talking about today, we do report out the B1 levels and the total aflatoxins. That's typically how we report out for aflatoxin contamination. And we did report out um, very good and achievable, acceptable recoveries across the board for all four matrices. And you can see under each matrix for almond milk, fresh corn, peanut paste, and curry powder, there are different levels of spiking that are performed. And this is based off of the, the spiking levels and expected aflatoxin contamination that you would find in each matrix. So overall acceptable recoveries and acceptable percent RSDs across of all matrices which proves our original method concept that one method to extract the original samples can be used that not 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 in all cases do you need to have a separate method to perform the liquid-liquid extraction step based off of a corn sample or a milk sample or a peanut paste sample. That if you really focus on the matrix water content, you're able to adjust and have one method. We've been able to prove that with this wonderful set of data. We've had quite a few internship successes. We've already talked about the publishing and ability to share our data and results with the community, but I think some other successes are very important to talk about. One of them is just the fact that new technology and automation generated acceptable results. 
And what this allows us to do is compare some of the new results to results from older methods and show that there is equivalency. So this fact that you can put automation and new technology into older methods really challenges scientists to start looking at what could be improved in some of the older methodologies. I think a lot of the importance of the internship is that it is generating some excellent discussion on what is possible when talking about implementing some new chemistry, technology, and automation to improve current laboratory efficiencies. I do want to point out uh, a big thank you and a special thank you to our collaborators, University of Wisconsin-Madison Chemistry Department, Shimatsu, and Sapelko. Uh, a special thank you to Elizabeth Krantz, who worked so hard during the internship and uh, obviously a very good chemist and expected to graduate, I believe, next year late. And uh, she will have some good prospects, I'm certain, as a result of this internship definitely wish her the best. I also want to extend a special thank you to Dr. Pamela Doolittle and Dr. Sherry Barda for their support and um, their attention to this internship. We do hope for many more like this and uh, do recognize all of the collaborators for their efforts and their involvement in making this possible. I do want to thank you for your time today. Again, my name is Tony Hoffein, Global Smart Prep Market Development Manager for Horizon Technology. My email address is on screen. If you do have any questions or would like to discuss any of the data that you have seen today, feel free to contact me. I welcome your questions and comments. Thank you so much.